All right, how is everybody doing today? Re re uh, participation will be rewarded with Seattle pins, Kid OEMR Seattle pins. We went, uh, they're Rocky Mountain pins, stainless steel and cloisonne. Nothing but the best, unless you have a nickel allergy, then don't sue me. <laughs> Just saying. There's nothing left, people. It's, there's nothing left, it's like you're bleeding a stone, not gonna happen. Uh, my name is Dr. Joe, Dr. Joe Cohen. Uh, I'm a board certified pediatrician. And I'm also founder and former CEO, now Chief Medical Officer of Kiddo EMR and Unificare Limited in Austin, Texas, and London, England, respectively. Today we're gonna to talk about developing apps for healthcare. We're not gonna be talking about how to program them, but we're gonna talk about the med dev zone and how we are going to be lending our expertise to you guys to help hack healthcare to build hashtag apps with impact, all right? I'm a board certified uh, pediatrician. I finished med school in 1999 when I was 14. No, uh, uh, and uh, did my residency in general pediatrics at Mount Sinai University in New York City. And then I moved to Austin, Texas and founded Cedar Park Pediatrics. We're now 10 years old with a history of 5,000 patient charts and over 3,500 active patients. We voted the best pediatrician in Cedar Park, Texas, which is a suburb north of Austin. And we're very honored to be able to be parts of so many people's lives. I'm also the founder and chief medical officer, as I said, of Kid OEMR. I'm also been elected to the advisory board of IDEA, where I will help developers engage healthcare with technology in credible and meaningful ways. The last thing I'm here to do is lecture. I really like discussions. So I encourage people to disrupt me. I will, I'll just throw a pin at you, it's as simple as that. Um, so please, raise your hand, stand up, say you're wrong, we can debate it, go outside and fight. We'll be fine, all right? Good. So what is our mission? Why am I here? Why am I not seeing my patients today? Well, my mission is to harness the power of Android, to develop meaningful solutions that are credible and compliant with the law, at scale. One of the things that's made Kid OEMR so successful is our architecture. And we're able to s produce solutions for scale. Not just for one people, not just for people that can uh, afford iPads, not just for the people that have app store accounts. We are a global, thin client, cloud-based, electronic medical record platform for pediatricians, parents, and institutions. We do not market directly to children. And if you're gonna make apps for healthcare, you may want to keep that in mind. They are not your audience. Your audience are their parents. You really are opening a bag of worms if you're not building a game for children. If you're building some sort of healthcare app, it's going to become a major hurdle to get it approved and released and not sued. <clears throat> so what's the problem? The problem is, is that in the United States, healthcare spending is out of control. This Statistic is very well known. We spent $2.9 trillion in healthcare every year. That's more per capita than any nation in the world, and it's also more than any nation in the world. The problem is, is that only 1.9 trillion of that actually goes to your health. And $1 trillion is thrown in the garbage, in waste, inefficiencies, poor practicing, duplication of services, Omission of services, readmission, non-compliance. Anyone been to the doctor recently? Okay, so how much of the information did you take home from the visit? Zero or three? Zero. Okay, that's fine. Fine, you should say that. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bad arm. I'm like, I went to med school, people. When everyone else was making money off Dell in the stock market, I was learning about anatomy and physiology. N n you know, in the long run, I won, but... <laughs> Thank you, welcome guys, welcome. Uh, what Mark brought up and what I'm trying to make a point is, is at the end of your visit, what does the doctor spend time doing with you? He educates you about why you came here in the first place, right? Statistics show that no matter how much the pediatrician talks to the parents, no matter how much time he takes to explain 
you take at the max three information points home. All right. I believe this is one of the fundamental reasons why we take one million, one trillion dollars and throw it in the garbage. Because I see patients all the time come back to me saying, "We did what you said, and he's not better." And they didn't do what I said. They did what they thought they heard me say. And because there's no credible technology to transfer information from a doctor to a patient, we're missing follow-ups. We're missing follow-through, and we're missing patient compliance. Every mistake in made in healthcare, whether it's intentional or not, costs us money in the long run. If you're a diabetic and you're being treated for ketoacidosis, which is a very bad thing, you basically spend a week and a half in ICU, three days in step down, and five minutes at discharge. Why aren't there platforms where information can be transferred to the patient, where the patient can engage their care provider after discharge? Well, this is the result. A trillion dollars in, into the trash. A trillion dollars because of poor health information management. A trillion dollars due to poor, poor litigation and, and liabilities. All right, so let's move on. You know, until recently, as a physician, a physician who's very engaged in the tech community, I had no medical apps on this phone, none. None of them are worth my time. Recently found one, it's called Figure One. It's a app for, I didn't develop it, it's an app for doctors, it's like Instagram for doctors. We get to show you all of our patient rashes and everyone comments. It's in a HIPAA compliant fashion, but it's the first engaging platform for me. And there's just very few clinically relevant uh, applications that exist, and that's kind of why, where we live and why I started. So what's the solution? I don't know, some of you may have seen me last year at Big Android Barbecue, um, and the community really inspired me to come up with a, a, a platform to stand on where we can crowdsource with physician involvement that encourages innovative thinking and also helps us disseminate our innovative platform. And we're gonna go into what our platform does and what you guys will be able to do with it as you develop solutions for healthcare. The flop sweat in here is, is it's pretty, I feel like Kathy Griffin. Um, so what's the purpose is that we want, like I said, we wanna engage the community. We wanna make and, and make clear very discrete parameters and protocols and also provide you with a robust test environment of granular anonymized data in which to enforce information transfer, follow-up, communications, ratings, <clears throat> diagnostics, evaluation, and we're gonna add care value to the platform and to the process of medicine. Any questions so far? These are some of the hashtags we've been using. Apps with impact, it all goes back to where's, where's my healthcare app with impact? Where's my Facebook for doctors? Where's my end-to-end -end encrypted chat app? So I can talk to my patients without violating federal law. They don't exist. And if they do, they're built by large corporations and they're convoluted, they're not side by side, and they cost thousands of dollars a month. Apparently people still think we make a lot of money. Um, Yes, we make money, and we do it consistently unless you do something bad and are you know, put out of your profession. But the fact is, is that in today's day and age, we haven't gotten pay raises in decades, but that's not why I'm here. My, my, the way I'm here is because you know, we're going to disrupt healthcare. We're gonna take it back from the large corporations who are non-physicians who are trying to develop for healthcare, and they're making our industry more convoluted and less efficient. And that hurts who? Does it hurt me? Yeah, I complain about it for five minutes at the end of the day, but ultimately, who does it hurt? All these children here, they're the ones that it hurts. They're the ones that get suboptimal care. They're the ones that have to wait so long during the visit to see their doctor that by the time the end comes, where the real meat of the matter is, the reason you're there in the first place, is like, okay, I'll see you later. That's unacceptable. We can't do it. We're not sustainable. <clears throat> so why Kiddo EMR? With Kiddo EMR, especially in the last year, we have established two outlets for your development, the United States and the international market. Unificare Limited, our reseller, exclusive reseller in London, England, is gonna address UK and India, and eventually beyond, where your technology can be incorporated into what we're trying to do, and we'll also be giving you guidelines on how to address 
unique demographic populations. Remember that with a genetic pool comes differences in medicine, comes differences in treatment and outcome. One of the very simple examples is vaccinations. The United States vaccination program is a little bit different than the UK, but really different from India. Because of our architecture, we can adapt the protocol APIs for that, adapt the scheduling for that. But we really believe in an open architecture. Open source, <clears throat> I, I explain it this way. Our technology is not the electronic medical record. As a matter of fact, our EMR is open source. The technology is what we do with the data. Think about this, when everyone was using a quill and parchment, that was technology, the pen and paper came out and it was technology, but today it's just the pen and paper. And that's where we're going. Eventually, EMR and the data entry platform is really not gonna be the technology, but what you do with the data, how you incorporate it, how you stream it, and how you integrate it with patients and doctors' lives, that's our technology. When we're using open APIs in an agile architecture in which to address very customized populations in a very customizable way. By the spring 2016, we will have an anonymized test data pool, a test pool of data, where your applications will be able to use these demographics and medical indices and values in which to sandbox your apps and play with them. <clears throat> we, as a company, we have four legs that we stand on. We're an EMR, which actually stands for Electronic Medical Record, data, which stands for data, uh, health information exchange and an API, automated programming interface program company. Uh, we are built to be platform and device agnostic. We're built for Chrome. We believe in op open APIs, Internet of Things support, and we actually have Google Glass support for image up upload. Some of the milestones. We went live at my practice in Cedar Park Pediatrics in February of 2015, which was quite a day for us. I remember with the agile architecture and the thin clienting, we, were, we went live and there were some residual bugs left, but my co-founder literally was changing things on the fly and we were moving on, moving and grooving. Since going live at my practice, before we had Kiddo EMR, we were using another EMR client. Uh, it cost us roughly the national average to process one patient visit, $58. We now pay $17.60. My doctors work four days a week seeing about 25 patients where most practices work six days a week seeing 40 a day. And our patients have benefited for it. Between that time and around May, we realized we had something. And we went and filed the entity and started our business structure. And then I think you guys may have seen me last October. I was kind of a ranting lunatic. Uh, by May, we had founded our company in, in London and now here, I'm here to announce you know, our minimum viable product for our patient portal and a release candidate for our, our verification trials. And we're ready to scale. So it's an exciting time for us. And you. My slides are a little bit out of order. Does anybody have any questions so far? OK. So how does this work? How does the Kiddo EMR developer core, the med dev zone, and Kiddo EMR, and Unificare, and Dr. Joe, and you people, how does this all go together? Well, there's the first step is we want innovation proposals and discovery. Demonstrations, some of them are gonna come out of the code kitchen today, I hope. Value add propositions to our platform. Then we're gonna to collaborate together with the Kid OEMR developer core, and there'll be a link at the end to join that private community. And what, what our physicians will do, we'll provide ethical oversight to the technology you're trying to implement in healthcare. Remember, just in healthcare especially, just because it can be done, especially with children, doesn't mean it should be done, right? We don't want Snapchat for STDs, right? That, I'm sorry kids, uh, sexually transmitted infections. Herpes, you know, that type of thing. I'm treading on shallow ground here. So, so. Are any of your parents here? Oh, okay, good. Don't, just don't tell them you saw me today. But ethical oversight is very important. And that kind of has to do with why I've moved over from chief executive officer to chief medical officer. As a matter of fact, the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics on LinkedIn, he's like, congratulations on your promotion. Which I didn't really see it that way. I was like, but I want to be in charge. <laughs> <laughs> but after seeing what Raj, our, our CEO in London, has to deal with, I'm like, thank God I don't have to do that. 
Uh, and step three is publish, right? Publish. <clears throat> so what is the technology? This was actually taken through glass in my office. I have permission to share this, so don't call the lawyers. Uh, so our technology, we talked about this, EMR data API and HIE. So let's start with the EMR, electronic medical record. It's pretty simple. We basically are a data entry portal with a HIPAA compliant database for the entrance and maintenance of your healthcare information. What, whose doctor uses an EMR here, anybody? God, you need to find other doctors. <laughs> How, who's writing on paper? That they, they could walk in, their doctor writes on paper. Paper. It's, it's not bad. It's pretty much the way it is, unfortunately. It's sad, you know? Why, does anyone want to know why their doctor's probably still writing on paper? Anyone have any ideas? Yes. Funds. Funds. Smart kid. We need, here, take my card. Here, give him a pin. Give him a pin. I should probably take him out of the bag first before I throw him. So aerodynamics, physics was never my strong suit. Yes, another one. Excellent backup and contingency. Yes. Okay. So dictation and dictation interfacing. Yes. These guys are rock stars. I don't know any of them, by the way. I didn't ask them to come here. <laughs> One more. Let's go for, uh, on the right there. We, both of you will have a chance. Don't fight. First is, pick first. On paper? Okay, what happens if you lose it, though? No indexing, right? Dewey Decimal System? Do you guys know what Dewey Decimal System is? Okay. Well, I'm old, I know. And you know, you would go to the library and, and you would go through the Dewey Decimal System and you walk in and the book's not there. Then what do you do? Do you go to the search bar? <laughs> the search bar at, at my library served coffee. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Yes. Yes, yes. All right, everybody that answered something, you've all got jobs in our new marketing department. So we've heard ease of use, we've heard archaic technology, we've heard someone, we're hearing my phone go viral, thank you everybody. Um, we've heard expense, et cetera. Every one of you are correct, absolutely correct. And as a doctor making this company, I have done my very best to be a domain expert establishing solutions that are credible. And this is what doctors will tell you when it comes to why they don't like or are not using an EMR. Remember that the doctor usually doesn't have the decision. Usually they work for somebody who says, okay, we have this great new system. Let's go for training for a week during, on your Saturdays to learn how to use it. You may not know this. But as physicians, we are horribly obsessive and compulsive. As a matter of fact, the obsessive compulsive personality type is 130% more common in physicians than it is in the general population. Why is that? Remember that if your guy that you do your tires doesn't fill a tire up, forgets to do it, you walk back and say the tire's flat. But if I forget to do something, it could be life or death. And as a result, with our OC personalities, we always do things by the same procedural. Like for instance, in the last 15 years, I've never approached a patient on the left-hand side. I was trained to do it on the right, and that's what I do. I start here, and I work my way. But in EMR, especially those built by developers, are asking doctors to approach on the left-hand side. They're hijacking our process, and that is no longer acceptable in my opinion. They believe, that it can't be better. They don't have time to learn how to develop. They don't have time, like myself, to show their passion and try to disrupt the industry. So we're gonna do it for them. And we're gonna show them 
that they can do it the way that they've been taught to do it. If you hijack a, a doctor's process of care, they're going to make mistakes. And doctors are really sick of having to bend over backwards to accommodate their EMR. I've spoken to a lot of my colleagues and even new doctor friends. The most common thing they hear when they, at a demonstration is when they make a feature request, I want to be able to do A, B, and C. The number one thing they hear from the developers is, you're not going to want to do that. This is how it works with our system. And that, I'm sorry, is unacceptable. In the era of Facebook, in the era of Google, when we can track our ex-boyfriend or girlfriend like a stalker, and then we say to the doctor, oh, but you can't. You got to start, you got to follow them on by foot. You know, the analogy is thin, but very important to understand. So, but we talked about, well, the technology is not the EMR. So what are we doing here, right? Well, it's the data that's the, the real win here. By defacing data, it becomes anonymized and becomes granular. It's granular and it becomes extremely pliable and we can make conclusions with that data that have never been able to be made before. Yes, question. Uh, is it really worth it to go through the amount of money it costs to go through the system? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I'm broke, don't sue me. There, no, they got caps on it. That's all right, I got my stitch kit in the back. I have tetanus shots too. All right, I'll have someone pass it back, Joe. Did you guys get it? Pass it back. <clears throat> Anyways, this is a really overly convoluted slide that I'm going to skip. This one, though, however, shows a little bit more of what our architecture is like. Um, basically, if you see this, does that show up there? Okay, so because we're in the cloud, because nothing exists in the physician's office, he can take his practice-based access or even remote access from home. Uh, I can see patients on my way home, actually, if they're on the way, of course. Um, then we have a remote hosting service where we use drive-level encryption and a private HIPAA cloud. Uh, and then around that, we build this analytic cloud, which is the anonymized data. But you can also see here that other people who have been credentialed can access information that's relevant to them with granular access control lists. For instance, the school nurse that is near my office. Um, we're gonna, it is possible for her to have an account into our chart so that her students, she can have all of their shot records, any notes excusing them from school, any medication, one second, any medication uh, authorizations, right? Who's a parent? What do you have to do, Stacy, when your school wants your shot record for your kid? Okay, Stacy's not a good, Stacy? No, okay, is this anybody else? Yes, what do you have to do? Go to the doctor, get it signed, go to the school, drop it off. I'm not, this, I didn't make it up. Don't look at me like that. But okay, you go to the doctor, do they give it right to you? No. no. You have to then go to the doctor, ask for it, go home, wait for a call, go back to the doctor. Find out they actually mailed it to the school. Which is not allowed, they're not allowed to mail it, for, you know, okay. What, why? Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, why? <laughs> why? Okay, we're gonna change that. And we're changing that in Cedar Park, in our microcosm. Our school nurses will log into the system. We will have our patients consent for that ahead of time. And they will have the health information exchange. We'll give them the information they do. And you know what? They won't bother my staff. It takes a lot of time for us to process that as well. <clears throat> open APIs, open API project. Everyone know what an API is? Can someone explain it to me? Never mind. <laughs> it's a quiet crowd in here. Uh, the harness. <laughs> The power, we're going to harness the power of a full open source platform. This whole room snafu got me all turned upside down today. Um, we're going to integrate third party services. Let me give you an example. We have a partnership with a company in Paris called Slow Control. They are about to announce their baby giggle. I didn't name it. <laughs> and the French spelled it G-I-G-L. Um, so giggle. Uh, what it is, is a sleeve that's Bluetooth enabled with an inclinometer and volumetric sensing. 
So, okay, who has a baby? You, you pour it, you, you need to keep track of feeding. You pour it in the bottle, you measure it, you put it, write it down, give the baby their feed, write down how much they ate, how long it took. What this sleeve does is it actually knows how much you poured in the bottle, it senses to the parent the best angle to hold the bottle and it evolves as a feed, and also records volume, lumps, air feeds, rate of feed, and presents it in a graphical format. So, when a patient brings their newborn to me, I sit there and I say, okay, how's the feeding going? Good, all right, we're gonna go and take a look at him now, right? Instead, with, with our baby giggle, all of the feeding data that's been compiled by the hardware will show on the date of service and give the doctor not only volume, but pattern, rates of feeding, caloric intake, and overall calories per kilogram per day with no effort at all. And because we can stream that data through our health information exchange using our APIs, we can present that data to the doctor in real time. And the parents are more engaged as well because they know they're getting good data. So we're either dealing with an overexhausted newborn parent who's like, it's going good. Or we're dealing with a, pl a platform, a modified self platform, that gives us the data securely, privately, and efficiently. And I think that works out better. There was a question over here. Please. Yes. That's a good question, and I am going to be, my co-founder's here and is going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, and I want to stick with that question in a second, but uh, it, it, what, you're, what the answer is, it does have to do with, you know, you, end user authorizations as well. Uh, so your level of security is, you know, my login to the platform, uh, timing out, auto timing out so that you, no one else can walk up behind you and see it, the logging in on your device and whatnot. Also, the fact is, is we don't sync to our workstations, we expose to our workstations, but we'll have more on that, okay? I didn't leave any of that round, uh, out, Ron? I left some out? I got it. My talk last year was titled, I'm a doctor, not a developer. Yeah. Let's see some of these things in action. Well, it was, yeah, tears, I know. Okay, let's talk about camera support, right? These are two diagnostic images I took with Google Glass. These are images that are actually in patient charts. And patients who have doctors that write or use most conventional EMRs, this finding would be documented as, this one on the, here. This one is two flesh-colored keratinized papules with central punctate ichthyosis of one to two millimeters on the extensor surface of the right elbow. How long does that take to type? It takes about 45 seconds to a minute for me, med students maybe two to three, five minutes, right? Instead, I take the photo, it shows up in the chart, and we move on. So I'll annotate here instead, volar surface, right elbow. Okay, and the other one, large macules of alopecia consisting of vellish hairs and exclamation point hairs of 25 to 30 millimeters on occiput without any signs of rubric or dolor. Or we can, say it with me. As a matter of fact, we're in for a treat today. I'm actually going to show you our demonstration server and that's how that works. So this, these are mock patients. Let me, uh, let me hope that that's not, is that the minimize one? Yeah. Ah, sweet. Uh, so in a patient's visit, we're going to actually use just the device hardware because this module requires us to have, be on a secure network. Um, <clears throat> We have an image assessment, whoops, network, oh, is it going to do that? There we go. So our image graduate, you can actually capture the photo. It's going to be a little slow because the network here is so fast. So, yeah. so here we are, I'm capturing. Now this camera can be anything, it could be your camera for your cell phone, it could be Google Glass, it could be the, something like the HTC Re camera. And we capture it. I look, I look great, don't I? 43 tomorrow. Uh, we capture it. It takes forever because we're not on my own network. It goes into the date of service here. And I can annotate going to be 43. Save it. 
And now the information showing up on the date of service. And I'm going to show you a little bit more on this, a few examples on how that actually means something. <clears throat> so back to that. Let's take a look at this, this boy right here. With the direct camera support, we're pre preserving the visual diagnosis. Does this mean anything to a parent of a sick child? Does it? It means a lot. You know, if teen, we have a lot of teens here. You know, your acne, right? You know, the doctor's writing, not that any of you have it, but. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. <laughs> STDs and, and condom all acne. That's great. We'll be having another talk at 2 o'clock where we're talking about tech and medicine. I'm sure you guys are going to love to call it kids in tech. Um, anyways. If the doctor wanted to know how you improved, wouldn't it be better if he had a picture of your skin to compare with? Okay, this is a very unfortunate boy who had something with a really long name. And it, the top picture is when he came to see me first. So then I did some of my magic, and we look at the bottom picture, and that was about a day or two later. Is there any doubt in your mind that this patient is improving? You all have honorary doctorates. You just did it. Yeah, you just did it. Is there any doubt in the lawyer's mind of the parent later on that says, he didn't make him better? Right? Is there any doubt? Because I'll tell you, you know what the tar chart would say? It would say two flesh-colored keratinized papules with central punctate ichthyosis of one to two millimeters on the extensive surface of the right elbow dash improved. I'm, I'm not, that's what they train us to do, OK? So we have, that's our standard of care, people. We're going to change the standard of care and enforce it, okay? It lowers your liability. It helps you gauge progress. It's meaningful documentation. It takes no time. It's secure. It's safe. It's efficient. It improves the health, health and lives of my patients. My patients need that. Here's another ex example of how we use our APIs through a HIPAA-compliant Google Calendar support. Yes, with my locked phone, I can have my HIPAA-compliant patient calendar on my Google Calendar with full compliance. Try to do that with one of the large corporate products. It's not going to happen. Shows the power of our open APIs. Our Google Ask support, this is a wireframe that's really small and blurry, uh, but it shows how we can use Glassware, the wonderful Mirror API, uh, SDK, whatever it's called, one of those things, both, and it's SDK. And we can use the hardware to capture Meaningful data for our patients. All right. Any questions? Health information exchange. This is a generic, yes. Uh -huh. Oh, it's, it's, it needs work. That's why I'm talking to you people. It needs work. I'm trying to find it. There it is. Yeah. Um, I used to wear glass a lot. It's kind of getting past my threshold, one second, of, of wearing. I can't wear something three years old. Um, but it, it's really slow. It gets really hot. It's at work where I need it. But you know, we need to see improvements in the hardware. Um, we need to see other form factors that don't make you look like um, someone that on Star Trek. Um, actually, they look better on Star Trek. But oh, he just filmed that Google. That's from Google. I'm going to hell. All right. There was a question back there. Yes. OK, that's a good question, and I may have not been clear. It's the doctor's responsibility of taking the, doc, the, the visual diagnosis and actually writing what he thinks it is. Um, in, in the medical data format, I'd take the picture and in the assessment section of the plan. So we have a child with that rash. That first one is actually what we call is just some warts. So I would actually assess it as warts and, and write in my treatment plan. So the, we don't, unfortunately, we, are, we cannot make technology legally in this country that acts like a doctor. We can only make technology that assists a doctor. So otherwise, you put me out of a job. <laughs> Health information exchange. The universal adapter for the efficient, streamlined transfer of HIPAA-compliant data, no matter what it is. It's all ones and zeros. Thank you. Am I sweating more now? Did I pee my pants? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> and it, it can be used for any amount of data. Remember, we're laid, we've laid the infrastructure down. 
we've established the trans data, personal data transfer protocols. And this is where all of it gets really exciting. This is our patient portal prototype. Um, and what it allows you to do, and what it allows our patients to do, more importantly, is to completely manage their child's record on their phone. This is an exposure framework, so basically they log in and the data opens, so, uh, very similar to, say it with me, Facebook, right? If you're not logged in, what's there? Nothing, Nothing except for the stuff they put on there to track you. We can't do, we're not doing that. <laughs> um, this allows a parent to check their upcoming appointments, reschedule said appointments, allows you to read messages from your doctor, uh, it allows you to pay, for uh, any of your services and co-payments. Uh, also allows you to refill your prescription. What did you used to do before this? What did you do? You went in, you stood in line for them to forget you and go back four days later and go back and stand in line. No more. And the other things that patients can do is check out their lab test results. These are, this is a mock-up, so it's not very clear. Um, medication allergies medication list. So we, let's go back to that, kids, let's go back to that example. Parents are out of town, you didn't listen to them, and your friend ran over your, their, your foot with their car. All right? And that's actually a true story. And you have an allergy to a medicine they need to give you, but you have no idea what it is. You show them exactly what it is here. It saves time, saves lives, saves money. Yes, in the back. Eventually it will, it doesn't. And he asks if it has access to insurance information. <clears throat> it's not in the best interest of large healthcare conglomerates to ac expose their data. So there's tons of different systems, they're not all meeting the same convention, but eventually they'll see it our way. And if they don't, then the patient can help you know, advocate for their own data transfer. The patient can do whatever they want with their data, but that's a great question and you know, we're gonna just have to disrupt the industry until they see it our way, yes? That's a good question. And that has to do with the way that the database is encrypted and also in the, our, our hardware infrastructure. And we'll get a little bit more into that later. Most of the data breaches, as a matter of fact, all of the big high, pro, high profile data breaches that you've read in the news, they all had their data stored with no encryption. Like InHealth was one. There's, there's just, someone just walked up to the server with a thumb drive, stuck it in, took their data. <clears throat> Okay, so also reports whatnot. Let's go back to the presentation. It's exciting, isn't it? And it's gonna save us time. So imagine a patient has a picture from the rash from last night, right? They can actually take the photo, store it in the app, and the doctor pulls it out of the cloud and puts it in their chart. So the patient came in, this is what it looked like last night. This is what it looks like today in my office, and then tomorrow, this is what it looks like. Yes, in the back. It's completely personal. Nobody random will be able to see it. You need to authenticate yourself. You also need to identify that the doctor you're seeing with and authenticate them, and they would see it. Okay, a lot of people worrying about security. That's good. So why Android? Well, Android, I see most of the phones I see in my office are Android headsets. Cracked Android headsets. Because kids just, they're like, oh, great. <laughs> It's like a splinter waiting to happen. It's really good for business. But it's the most affordable and generalizable platform, say it with me, at scale. Thank you. Well, you said it a little after me. Let's work on that. And children are our number one renewable resource. Okay? <laughs> what? They are. <laughs> they are. What? Okay. Cell phones. Did I say something wrong? <clears throat> Special considerations, healthcare, uh, affordability, accuracy. We don't want to purvey our, our information in with it less accuracy. Privacy, we've talked about. And also, one thing that we don't always talk about is accessibility. You know, you may not see a lot of children in wheelchairs at the mall, 
but you see a lot of children with wheelchairs in my office. What does that tell you? That your audience is more likely to be a specialty audience. And you better bake in some accessibility for them because they're just as entitled to this revolution as we are. <clears throat> so keep calm and follow the prime directive. HIPAA, the Healthcare Information Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which really has nothing to do with portability at all, is all about keeping data private, keeping it protected. It's the prime directive of healthcare information. <clears throat> and we're going to keep going. So, uh, whoops. I'm going to introduce my co-founder, Ron Criswell. He's the tech guy, and he's going to take a few minutes to talk to you guys about how we've established our HIPAA-compliant architecture. Please welcome Ron. Ron Criswell. Try to answer some of the questions that people brought up about how we have implemented a lot of this, these tasks and, and how we're going about making the software and the, the data accessible and still maintaining security and, and protection of that data. We have kind of two goals that seem to be opposite ends of the spectrum. We want to make a fairly open, easy to use, fairly simple um, platform and API that encourages development and encourages people to use it. At the same time, we need to make sure that we adhere to all of the, the HIPAA requirements, that we maintain security, that we maintain privacy in that data. The way we've gone about doing that is we use fairly standard technology, browser-based technology and, and supported um, HTTP protocols um, in a method that is compatible with, with application development on either a, a um, portable platform with an Android type application or with um, HTML inside a browser like Chrome or Firefox or something like that. Essentially what we do is you have to authenticate. Your authentication mechanism from the API is OAuth2, which is a very familiar, very standardized mechanism that Google uses in a lot of their applications. What OAuth2 does is it allows us to validate who the device is or who the software is that's trying to talk to us as a primary uh, connection security. And secondly, it allows us to verify that you have access to the specific account that you want to have access to. Somebody was asking earlier about how you make sure that you're only talking to this one person. That's the way that we do it, is we provide the OAuth2 uh, security algorithms that allow a, a, an application to connect to us. And if you provide the correct credentials, then we'll allow you to access it. It's the exact same kind of technologies that the banks use for signing on to your online banking accounts. Very tried and true application, uh, very, very secure use of, of the whole algorithm and, and schema process to be able to do that kind of connection. So that's one part of our um, connection process. The second part is we're using an SSL connection, end-to-end -end communication. We never provide a mechanism for storing the data on the endpoint. You don't store it in the phone app. You don't store it on your computer. You don't store it in the browser. It's always a pull the data, display it, and then throw it away. That's necessary to make sure that you don't have problems with storing unencrypted data anywhere in the, in the, the setup. Yes? We're not doing two-factor authentication right now. We could do it, um, and we're kind of looking at that as an, as an alternative for future mechanisms. Like I say, right now what we're doing is we're checking to make sure that the application that's trying to talk to us is our application or it's an approved application. So the application has a set of credentials to authenticate itself, and then there's a secondary level for the authentication of the individual records that they're trying to access. That's as far as we've gone with it right now. Not at this point, but um, um, you know that's a good point, and and that's something that we may need to go through and do something more along the the uh, um, process of having an identifiable figure um, that that a lot of the banking applications use, and some of those types of things. These are the types of uh, areas that we're needing participation. We're needing input. Um, you know, we don't pretend to have all the answers. I'm kind of giving you where we're at right now. 
But we definitely have room for improvement. We need input from the communities. We need to know what types of things are recommended. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're hoping to get from, from our partnerships with developers are, you know, what are the areas that we need to improve on? As far as the, the, uh, the data, we keep all of the data encrypted on uh, fully encrypted databases um, so that there's no chance of being able to access it brute force. Um, but there is, you know, when you're transmitting data, you do have that vulnerability. You know, need to make sure that you've got the correct connections. Um, and somebody else had a question. So anyway, uh, we're, we're starting to get more people in, so I'm sure that we're getting close to the next, uh, uh, next presentation side. But really what we're doing, oh, the other, the other piece for, for external access, the API access, what we're working with is standard RESTful APIs. The data connections are, are designed to be able to provide access. What we're looking for and help in the development uh, arena is for people to come up with new and, and interesting ways of processing that data and making that data available to other applications and in ways that help improve the quality of the healthcare, help improve the outcomes and so forth. We're providing the tools into the data. What we're looking for is help coming up with better new methods of presenting the data, massaging the data, and making the data useful, turning it into information for the end users. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. All right, did that clear it up a little bit? A couple of things uh, right now, we do have stopgap measures for two-factor. Um, any of our cloud-based access, you need to authenticate through a VPN before you access it, and then our actual native uh, site of practice, you actually would have to have uh, the credentials for the network as well. Uh, so we're very well aware of, <laughs> excuse me one second. We're very well aware of the need for two-factor authentication. I think that it's very important. Uh, we have other ways of solving it as using two-factor and putting our, our, pay, our login wall behind maybe Google Apps for Business, Google Apps for Work, and where you actually enforce two-factor that way. But one of the things that we've been looking at with the, the mobile technology, how does the patient link to the doctor? We, I feel that we use kind of like a Bitcoin model where you scan a code or you enter a code that's unique to that physician that you can only get there at that office, and that connects you through the application to your chart and your provider. But these are excellent questions, and exactly why we're here. <clears throat> because we need your help. We need your help to take our uh, platform and present it to our patients, and hopefully your patient, uh, patients that you know, and people that you know as well. And this is the process. Basically, you're gonna come to us with a discovery or proposal. <clears throat> You'll present your ideas to the developer core or to us directly. We will then go and vet it with medical and ethical advisory board that we already have in London and here in Austin, uh, here in Texas. We'll actually analyze its practicality, the ethics, and if it is indeed uh, apps with impact, right? Then we'll go through prototype and testing, and analysis for HIPAA compliance and usability, and finally release of an MVP with reiteration and update process. <clears throat> it's time, guys. We can innovate, disrupt, save money, save lives, make apps with impact. Actually, this right here is the London store, the Google store in London. It's, if you're ever there, it's on uh, Warren Street and Tottenham Court Road. It's a lot of fun. They have a little spray painter. It's a digital spray paint bottle that you can actually pick your color and spray paint. And what's, of course, in tr true Google form, when you shake it, it, it makes the sound like little balls running around in it. It's, it's pretty neat. I go there every time I go, and more than once. So if you're interested in working with us, this is QR code will take you to the, to the DevCore page. And <clears throat> you can also search it on uh, Google+. Please join. It's a private community because we, we just want devs, all right? Devs and kids, well, you know, and people that are interested. We just don't need trolls and people that are not relevant to the project. <clears throat> this is not a bridge in Denmark. Um, you can also hit me up at my email uh, on Twitter at IKC or at Kiddo EMR, and then plus Joey Cohen MD or plus I am Dr. Joe Kiddo EMR because that makes a lot of sense. And I'd like to see if anyone else has any questions. Did we answer them all already? Okay, I have one more Seattle pin. Does anyone have a question now? <laughs> yes, he has a question. Okay.
Okay, I'm going to reiterate your question. It's a good one. What he asked was, there's a lot of EMR systems out there. Is there a common framework for transferring information? Because the default right now is fax. And yes, I do. I have a fax machine in my office. My name is Dr. Joe, and I'm stuck on fax machines. Uh, it's disgusting, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, and there are. There's a, the CDA, Clinical Data Architecture Protocol, HL7, Health Level 7. These are open source standards that are prepared to handle the transfer of data. Uh, Kid OEMR, is, we just finished our C-CDA uh, architecture import-export. We can actually take information from anybody's EMR and incorporate it into our platform. Unfortunately, most EMRs don't want you to do that, which in my mind is corporate greed interfering with the health and well-being of children in this country and others. And, then, and so we're using open, open protocols to help facilitate that data transfer as well. Here. I'm, I know. It's <laughs> like, we can edit that out, right? Mm, yes. Good question. FDA approval. What is the threshold for something to become FDA approved? Yes. Yeah, I, gave, I talked a little bit about this last year, and I'm glad you brought that up because I'm realizing I had a few holes in my presentation. I'll get to you. You can put your hand down. Um, when you go see your doctor and he's not using an EMR, he's using a what? Pen and paper. Does an F, is a pen and paper FDA approved? No. It, okay, let's say he's using an EMR. Is his MacBook e, uh, e, FDA approved? Is his EMR FDA approved? No. But if he builds a machine that tested blood sugar, an actual medical intervention, and that affected the treatment of that patient, he would have to have that FDA approved. There was an app that was a uh, diabetic app that was uh, built, that was proved to lower blood sugars better than metformin, a drug. Well, that had to be FDA approved. And there was actually nothing in the app that was actually a medicine or it was just a dietary modification app. And that needed to go through FDA approval because it was actually implementing a care plan for the patient. Yes, yeah, so you want to follow up? If you were building, you would need to go through the reliability of the, of the device to actually tell you what it's actual, the truth, and that would require the FDA approval, but let's say you were building um, like a Chromecast for an app where to, you can project, and that probably wouldn't need to be. I'm sure that there's gray areas in this, and that's a great question. I'd like to talk to you more afterwards about that. And really what he's asking is, where's the line? In other words, where does the line between HIPAA compliance uh, sorry, FDA approval and not needing FDA approval. Where's that line drawn? And right now it's drawn through medical intervention and evaluation and management tools uh, and treatments and therapies. Uh, does it mean that you know, we can't do a handshake, a data handshake? I I'm not sure. That's a good question. Who else? Yes. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. Can you stand up and say it louder? Hmm. Oh no, that's he's tough over there. I didn't, I didn't think about that. Um, go on welfare. No. <laughs> That's, I mean, I, look, I, I'm a, you know, I, I don't, a lot of my family, when they see me on LinkedIn being CMO of this and doing that, they're all like, congratulations, we knew you'd be successful. I've been running a practice for 15 years. That's my success. And, you know, if, if this, if, like, we were to go, you know, massive electromagnetic pulse tomorrow and every computer was dyed and fried, i just go back and see my patients again. But as far as you guys are concerned, what we're trying to do is build an ecosystem. We're trying to build a standard for the care of patients. And the cloud and the, and the architecture is there to s satisfy the patient's needs long after I'm in the ground. 
you know, this, there's a famous quote, if your goals, if you meet your goals or you set your goals to be met by the end of your lifetime, you aren't thinking big enough. And really what I'm trying to do here is just the start. So that's good. And hopefully with great minds like you all contributing, we won't have to worry about failure. Yes, in the back. It doesn't, but it does. Okay, that's a bit weird. It does, no. That's our plan, okay? We, the data exists. We have a very robust 10-year uh, historical granular data. Um, but that is exactly what we're trying to do. I, I can show you um, one thing if you, if you want. Uh, <clears throat> I did a heat map. I took... This I, had to do this, pers this I did about a year ago myself, and I did a heat map. I used a weather mapping algorithm, and I took my data from, uh, can you guys see that? I took my data from two winters in Austin, Texas. I took patient location and, and a time and severity of allergies in January and February in Austin. That means you're allergic to cedar. And I took severity, location, and time, and this is what came out for the months of December and January of 2013 and 2014. If you see here, the red is the most severe cedar fever allergies, and green and yellow are less. What this actually showed us is this green belt right here was pollinating all of Lago Vista, Texas. And the mayor of Lago Vista actually was very interested in this analytic, and we actually got some press off of it. But that's what we're talking about robust data manipulation, presentation in ways that actually matter. Now, I'm a human who has a day job, and this took me about two weeks. But with a, the proper architecture, proper programming, the proper brilliance, we're working to have this done autonomously, credibly, and in real time. So I really like your thinking. You definitely need one of my cards. Yes. Yes. She's asking, is this going to be a requirement for all doctors and healthcare professionals to use it? No. In, 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 the, in England, the National Health Service has tried to make something a requirement for doctors in England in 2012. They spent $15 billion on a solution and had to mothball it because doctors don't like being told what to do. <laughs> Go figure. We tell you what to do all the time. And our solution is bottoms up. We are going to make, we, you know, already the cost savings is making it pretty undeniable uh, argument, but you know, why do people use Facebook? Because they want to have that convenience. They want to know where their high school friends are. They want to be able to share pictures from when they were kids. They want to use it. Doctors want to use this. It's just we need to get it to them, right? And it's going to take some time. Well, who else? Am I missing anybody? All right, well, thank you very much for coming. I want to thank everybody for paying attention. and. I'll be here all week. We have um, 2 o'clock at Kids in Technology, Fireside Chat in Room 6, and also the big barbecues coming up tonight. I don't know if you guys have had Ray's. Uh, it's amazing stuff. So thanks for coming. <laughs>